is for the lost and lonely, for the broken and afraid. This is for those who are hurting. Open help is on the way.
As our men come to prepare to worship in our giving, would you pray with me this morning? Father, um, we pray that you would help us this morning to turn our eyes upon Jesus. I pray that we would be able to see him for who he is and that we would worship him and be drawn to him. God, I pray that our affections would be drawn to Jesus, that we would learn today to love him more, more deeply, more intimately, and to be closer to him, and that our affections would turn away from the things of this world, that they would lose their value in our eyes, and that Jesus would become so valuable that we would give all to follow and to know and to serve him. Thank you for blessing us, for giving to us, for being so good to us. This morning we give back to you and we want to say thank you and we recognize that everything that we have belongs to you and we are stewards of that. So help us to be good stewards this morning as we give out of the generosity of our hearts and may it be used for the work of your kingdom that the name of Jesus and the gospel may be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. You know this little song, sing it with us. Let's go. Would you take your Bible and turn to the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, and uh, find your way, and we're going to begin in Proverbs chapter number 18, Proverbs chapter number 18, and uh, this week is going to be very similar to last week where we spent our time scouring the Proverbs to see what it says about the topic at hand. And today our topic is we are talking about words, the power of words, your speech, your communication, and how all of that plays into living a life uh, that is wise and following the Lord. Now, how many of you 
have ever seen words, someone's speech, um, really hurt someone? Whether that's, you know, your speech, that you said something to someone, that you could tell that it, that it affected them in a negative way. It really, really hurt. It was biting, cutting, um, harsh. Um, or maybe someone said something to you that was that way and you felt it immediately. It was like a sword that pierced your heart just because of what someone said. Um, but how many of you have also seen speech or your words do a lot of good, where you say something to someone and you can immediately see the change in their demeanor. Uh, you can see the change on their face. Uh, the Bible calls it, uh, their countenance was changed. And you kind of get it, their fate, you can just tell. I can remember one time, um, there was a young lady who came to our church and she was uh, saved and then baptized and after she was saved and baptized, I went to, or after she was saved, I went to visit her to talk to her about baptism, and her daughter was there listening to our conversation, and I was helping to make sure she understood the gospel, and her daughter um, was listening in on the conversation, and I began to talk with the daughter, shared the gospel with her, and the moment that um, I began to share the gospel with her, her entire face just changed. It brightened up, and the, the daughter ended up receiving Christ, and they were baptized together, and it was a really cool moment. But those words, just the power of those words, and the gospel has a special power beyond just our words, but just those words can change someone's life for the good or for the bad. Now, the, um, I was doing some, I guess, research on this, and I, I found out that, um, and this is related, so this is not just but the Titanic, the ship, the Titanic was over 800 feet long. It was almost 900 feet long. But it had a small rudder in the back that was about 15 feet long. Now, 15 feet's kind of long for a big piece of metal, but compared to eight or 900 feet, that's kind of a small, a small thing. The Brother, the Lord, the half brother of Jesus, uh, James, wrote a little letter, and in his letter, he uh, likens our tongue to a ship's rudder, and he says that even though that the rudder is small, it turns an entire nine hundred foot ship. And the same is true with our tongue. Even though it's a small member of our body, it can turn an entire life or an entire situation. It has great power. And of course, our tongue is referring to our words. It's referring to our speech and how powerful our speech is. Our words are powerful. How many times have you seen one word change a situation? How many times have you seen it cause major damage in a situation or in a life? How many times has it brought great healing? And that's what we're going to talk about because words is a major theme in the book of Proverbs. And the main teaching about words is really this, and this is what we're going to talk about over the next few minutes. It's that what we say has power, and so we should guard what we say. What we say has power, so we should guard what we say. Now, we're going to jump around a lot, so I hope you have your uh, Bible drill hands ready or your scroll, or if you don't want to do all that, you can watch it on the screen, okay? So, the first thing we talk about here is just the power of words, how powerful words are. Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 21. This is kind of the, the theme, I guess, in Proverbs about words here, summarized in one proverb, Proverbs 18, 21. He says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. It's like the words are seeds that are sown in the soil of people's lives. 
Words are never neutral. They're always, they may be neutral coming from you, or at least you think, but they're always taking, taken positively or negatively. And they yield a harvest, a fruit, either to life or to death. In other words, they can influence for either good or bad. Listen to Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 4. We'll talk about some of the good that, that words can do. Proverbs 18, 4. The words of a person's mouth are deep waters, a flowing river, a fountain of wisdom. So the idea there is that words can give deep insight. And wise words are not only deep, but they're valuable. They're accessible. They're life-giving. He says it, they are a fountain of wisdom. Listen to what he says just a couple chapters over in Proverbs 16, 24. <clears throat> he says, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the taste and health to the body. The image there is of a honeycomb. And has anybody ever harvested honey before? Okay. Um, and you see the honeycomb, and the image of the, is of this honeycomb that's just dripping with, uh, with honey. It's just so full that it drips with honey. And he says, pleasant words are like that full honeycomb. And they fall from this heart that is overflowing with wisdom. And there is something sweet and beneficial about these words. They're just sweet to the taste, and they're helpful and beneficial uh, even, he says, to the body. There's something about them that can affect a person for the good. Look in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. I'm trying to build a case here for the power of words and how good they can be and how uh, even, we'll see in a minute, just how damaging they can be. Proverbs 15, 1. Listen to this. A gentle answer turns away anger, but a harsh word stirs up wrath. Words have the potential to either calm things down or to stir things up. And if you don't believe me, we're entering the political season. You just wait and see. Words have the ability to calm things down or to stir things up. A gentle word there, when he says a gentle word, it's a reference to the idea of peacemaking. That just with a gentle word, a one word, just, just speaking in a gentle, kind way... Can, can push down something that is already kind of raging there. It can, it can calm the situation. It can bring peace. It can diffuse a threatening or tense situation. A harsh word is a word that's designed to, to wound someone. And the idea is that words are so powerful that they can either quench the hottest anger or can fan a little flame into a raging fire. Now, some of you have seen this and experienced this in your marriage. You're getting a little tiff. Okay, it's not an argument because we don't ever argue, do we? But you get in these conversations, and one word can either take that conversation from just kind of like we disagree to a full-out fight, or it's kind of, you tell that it's getting tense and heated and one gentle word brings it back down. Has anybody notice that? You see that with your kids, right? The way that you speak to your kids um, or the way that your kids speak to you, okay? Everything's fine so they get a little back talk, right? But just one poorly timed cross word can set off an explosion. Words have power. Listen to uh, Proverbs 15, verse 4. It says, The tongue that heals is a tree of life, but a devious tongue breaks the spirit. Good, healing, helpful, or bad, damaging. Listen to Proverbs chapter number 10, verse 31. He says, the mouth of the righteous produces wisdom, 
but a perverse tongue will be cut out. And the word produces there is literally the word for bear fruit. The words of the righteous yield the fruit of wisdom. They grow. They learn. They give life to the people who hear. But a perverse tongue, which means a twisted or a crooked tongue or crooked speech, twisted speech, all it does is produce confusing and unhelpful things. And their words, he says, are cut off, which literally means that they, like a branch that's cut off from a tree, they die. It's kind of like the idea of that our words, when they are good and helpful, can have a lasting influence or they can fall and immediately die after they've left our mouth. Okay, think of it this way. I think of like a a honeybee, that when a honeybee will um, sting, You know, it stings one time, it loses its stinger, and it dies after it stings you. And that's kind of like the idea of our words when they're spoken negatively. They may sting once, but ultimately they die and they don't have the lasting influence that wise words will have. Now listen, they sting and the sting still remains, but the influence that our words could have had die out once they leave our mouth. So when we speak twisted words, we are wasting our words and the influence that we could have for good when we don't speak that way. Is everybody following what I'm saying? Okay, they are they're words that can influence people. Listen to Proverbs chapter 18. I love this one. Proverbs 18, verse number 8. Proverbs 18, 8, a, what's, what's the word there? Uh, that's, that's weak. Uh, let's see. All right, what does it say on the screen here? A gossip. gossip. Some people didn't want to say it because they felt convicted. I, heard, I know it. A gossip's words are like choice food that goes down to the innermost being. It's interesting. Proverbs 18, 8, where it says, uh, this is actually... Repeated in Proverbs 26, verse 22, and it reveals the negative effect words can have. And it's like listening to a gossip is like eating candy. Um, he uses the phrase there, choice food. And the, some translations will say dainty morsels. The gossip's word are like dainty morsels. It's like a dessert that's put in front of you. And what he says is that it's easier to push away a dessert than it is to not listen to, a wor- to the words of a gossip. No, I just, I couldn't, I can't eat that piece of pie. Just can't do it. No, but a gossip says, hey, did you hear about, how many of us would say, no, I just can't listen to that, right? We, we have a harder time not listening to the gossip, but listening to a gossip, and the reason is, is because we believe that it's like um, the word he uses is choice food. The words of a gossip, when somebody tells you something, you think that you've got something or you're getting something special that nobody else has. It's choice food. It's special food. You've got it. Nobody else is going to get it. You're receiving it, so you're going to know something nobody else knows. But the problem is, is that once it is shared, it influences you. You can't help but be influenced by it. It goes down, he says, to your innermost being. It settles deep within you. And you never look at a person being talked about the same way, even if you don't believe the gossip. Even if it's untrue, it automatically influences how you view another person. And my point is to just say that words have great power to either influence for good or influence for bad, for either life or or for death. And it's not just the content of our words, it can actually be the timing of our words that are important. Listen to Proverbs 15, uh, 23. He says, a person takes joy in giving an answer and a timely word, how good that is. Now listen to Proverbs chapter 25, verse number 11. This is a good one to, to memorize here. Proverbs 25, 11.
He says, a word spoken at the right time is like gold apples in silver settings. It describes something beautiful and valuable. A timely word is valuable and beneficial. So words have power to either influence for good or for bad. And our main point today is simply that since words are powerful, then we should guard our mouth. So since what we say has power, we should guard what we say. Listen to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 3. Here's the wisdom of Proverbs. That since your words have such power and ability to influence, you better be careful about what you say. Can everybody hear me? You got to be careful about what you say and how you say it. Listen, it's your, the content of your words, it's the tone of your words, and it's the timing of your words that have the influence for life or for death. Proverbs 13, uh, yeah, Proverbs 13, 3. Listen to what he says. The one who guards his mouth protects his life. The one who opens his lips invites his own ruin. You got to be careful about what you say. Listen to Proverbs chapter 21, verse 23. Proverbs 21, 23. Here's a good one um, that you need to remember whenever. Men, you need, to, you need to memorize this one right here. When your wife begin to tell you, you know, where you're wrong or what you need to do or something. Um, kids, listen to this. Li just listen. This is going to go a long way. For Proverbs 21, 23. The one who guards his mouth and tongue keeps himself out of trouble. The word guard and the word keep in that verse is the same Hebrew word. In other words, if you guard your mouth, then your life will be guarded. The idea is exercising great control of your speech because one of the characteristics of a fool is that they speak rashly. I don't know who said this, but it, it's not a proverb. It doesn't come from the Bible, but you've heard the saying, it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and speak and remove all doubt. <laughs> and the idea is that speaking rashly is one of the characteristics of a fool. Listen to Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. I know we're all over the place, but I'm going somewhere. Proverbs 12, 18. He says, there is one who speaks rashly like a piercing sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. It's the idea of a person who just opens his or her mouth and lets flow whatever the moment may bring. You know those people that have no filter? No offense if that's you. They just, they just whatever they're feeling or thinking in the moment, it just comes out of their mouth. And here's the image. There's no thought or weighing of the words. There's only reaction. You just immediately react with, by saying something, and the image is of a person standing there with the sword, just flailing the sword around in a crowd of innocent people. And that's what your words are doing. A person who doesn't measure his or her words wounds innocent people around them. Proverbs 29, verse 20. He says, do you see someone who speaks too soon? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Now that's interesting because the entire book of Proverbs is trying to get you to not walk the way of foolishness, to not be a fool, and to walk the way of wisdom. And they're saying that a person who just speaks too soon, who doesn't think, who doesn't measure their words, is really, there's more hope for a fool than for that person. Because the fool can still find wisdom. They can still, um, they can still kind of figure out the, these things and receive wisdom and not follow the way of foolishness. But a person who speaks hastily, 
And haste in the book of Proverbs in general is always a, a pathway to trouble. Moving too fast, speaking too quickly without thinking or measuring these things. And a person who speaks hastily has less of a chance or less hope than a fool does because that person won't stop and consider things any other way, despite the evidence that's around them. So people who are just speaking and just want to just shoot off at the gums, there's less hope for that person than there is for a fool who the Proverbs is trying to tell you not to be. So we should measure our words. Have you ever thought that maybe it would help and instead of just talking about what you're thinking or feeling in the moment that you could just be quiet for just a moment and think about what you're going to say and how you're going to say it and how it's going to sound. There's a lot of wisdom in that. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 13 He says here, the one who gives an answer before he listens, this is foolishness and disgrace for him. Some people think that they're witty and intelligent to always have a quick answer to something. You ever met those people? You ever been those people? And you, some of you who are not those people, you think about what you should have said, you know, a day later and you're like, man, I wish I'd have said it. But people think that the witty, it's witty and intelligent to have a quick answer to everything that comes up or to every situation or to every spe- something somebody says to you. But the Proverbs say it's actually foolishness to have that quick, witty, kind of sharp answer. It's a sign of folly and not cleverness. What they reveal is that they're not really concerned in hearing or understanding what's going on, but expressing their own insight. You remember what we talked about last week uh, in Proverbs 18.2? A fool does not delight in understanding, but only wants to show off his opinions. They don't really care about uh, listening. And this is what is happening. We don't listen to each other anymore. We only want to talk. We only want to express our opinions but we never want to hear, and we think that once we've said something that has, uh, we, like we've, we've gotten somebody. We've said something that has proven somebody else wrong, and we've got the upper hand. It makes us feel kind of powerful and good, and, and we got it, but we've yet to listen to the person, and we're speaking too soon. We're not listening to people. We should measure our words, and probably, to be honest, we should probably just start speaking less in general. Proverbs 10, 19 says this. When there are many words, sin is unavoidable. But the one who controls his lips is prudent. The person who just rattles on and on will not be able to avoid sinning. Now, James talks a lot about the tongue in chapter 3. Let me read what he says to you. You don't, don't have to turn there. But James chapter 3, verse 6, listen to what he says. He says, in the tongue is a fire, the tongue, a world of unrighteousness. A world of unrighteousness is placed among our members. It stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Haven't we experienced the damage our words can do to people? So speak less. Speak measured. When I was a kid, I took the hunter safety course. And probably the most profound, um, I remember a lot of things that I learned there. But the most profound thing I think I learned was that the teacher stood up in front of the class, in front of the group, and he had a can of shaving cream. And he brought another person up and he, he took the can of shaving cream and he said, hold out your hand. And he sprayed the shaving cream into the other person's hand. And he said, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to put the shaving cream back in the can. He said, I can't do that. 
It's impossible. He said, exactly. It's impossible. Now, some way you could do it. I don't know how. But it's virtually impossible to take the shaving cream and get it back in the can. And here was his point. His point was, is that the can is like the gun and the shaving cream is the bullet. And once the bullet is out of the gun, you can't get it back in. So you should be careful about where you shoot. Listen to me. Words work the same way. Because once they're out, they're out. Whether that's you speaking them, whether that is you writing them in a letter and sending it out, or whether you are putting it on social media. You say, well, I, I deleted those words. When they're on the internet, they're on there forever. Once the words are out, they're out. You can't get them back in your mouth. So you should be careful about how you speak your words. Because once they're out, they're out. And they either have the ability to influence a person to death or to life. For good or for bad. The truth about your words, and this is probably the part that you won't like as much is that your words reveal who you really are. Listen to Proverbs chapter 10, verse 20. He says, the tongue... Of the righteous is pure silver. The heart of the wicked is of little value. The heart is who a person really is, right? The heart is who a person really is. The tongue simply lets everyone know that truth. The contents of the heart are revealed by what we say. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12. He says this when he's speaking to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were the people who liked to talk a lot about the, how close they were to God. And this is what he says. He says, brood of vipers. Doesn't really sound like a pleasant way to begin a conversation. How can you speak good things when you are evil? Evil? We're not evil. We're the righteous people. We're the ones who are close to God. We're the ones who are trying to do everything the right way. For the mouth, he says, speaks from the overflow of the what? The heart. We've heard this before, hadn't we? When we talked about a few weeks ago, guarding your heart. Okay? For the mouth speaks the overflow of the heart. A good person produces good things from the storeroom of good, and an evil person produces evil things from the storeroom of evil. So your mouth is betraying, if you will, your heart. Your mouth, how you speak, is revealing the content or the character, I should say, of your heart. So to have healthy and wholesome words, we've got to have a healthy and wholesome heart. And I keep coming back to this every week because I don't want you to think that this is legalistic. And like uh, this week, you know, we've got, to go, we've got to start speaking better. What did we talk about last week? I don't even remember. Does anybody remember what we talked about last week? Somebody go back in their notes. So when we think about these things that we're talking about, whether it's parenting or marriage or, or you know, um, discipline is what we talked about last week, right? Receiving discipline. All right. All right, so I'm, we're not trying to get people to start doing these things better. 
I want you to hear the gospel. And the gospel is, is that in order for your words to get better and more healthy and more wholesome and more beneficial to people, what has to change is not your mouth, but your heart. That's what's got to change. That's what's got to change in me. And so whenever I have harsh words toward my children, that reflects not a character flaw in me. That reflects a bad heart that God needs to deal with. Whenever we use certain language, it reflects a heart. A heart that God needs to change. So let your heart be shaped and transformed by Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. I'm not asking you to change your words. I'm asking you to let God change your heart. And if you will do that, then your words will follow. Here's why I say that. I say that because, I say that because some of you need to get saved. And one of the ways that God brings it to your attention that you need Jesus is he has revealed to you that your words are unwholesome and unhealthy. You think back to the way that you think, the harshness that you speak with, the fact that you don't have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, Patience and self-control. Self-control. You don't have that. And the reason you don't is because you don't have the Holy Spirit producing that in you. And so you, God reveals that just through your words that you have a desperate need for Jesus. And that is the gospel. Because the gospel is not just what you believe to be saved. It is then the atmosphere of your life that you live in. And every single day, you've got to live in the atmosphere of the gospel so that your words will be healthy and wholesome. Don't just change your words. Don't stop cussing. I mean, stop cussing. But don't just stop cussing. Don't just stop being harsh. Don't just stop being sarcastic. You know what sarcasm means? Sarcasm is two Greek words that means to cut the flesh. That's what being sarcastic means. And sometimes, you know, we think it's funny, and I'm sadly sarcastically funny. No, I'm not funny. I try to be funny by being sarcastic, okay? But it's actually, it cuts people. It's harsh and demeaning and hurting, and we find out through those words just how much we need Jesus, Is there anybody, and don't answer out loud, unless you just want to say that's me, but is there anybody in here who sees in this situation, in this topic, their need for Jesus? I need Jesus to guide my words. I need him to influence my words. I need to have a healthy heart so that I can speak healthy and wholesome things. So do you want your words to be life? Or do you want them to be death? Do you want them to be constructive? Or do you want them to be destructive? Do you want your words to be beneficial and have a lasting influence on people? Control your tongue. Measure your words. Let them be shaped by God's truth. But ultimately, let Jesus have control of your heart. And words will follow. And maybe, maybe, maybe there is someone here this morning that your words have hurt someone. You have said something with the intention of hurting someone else. And maybe God has revealed that to you. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you that where your words have hurt, I'm going to ask you to go and to Bring healing through your words. Here's how to do it. By asking for forgiveness. Telling them you're sorry. Turning from that and saying, you know, I was wrong in what I said. Why? Because a gentle answer can turn away wrath. Jesus even said that if you remember when you come in to bring your gift on the altar and you remember that someone has something against you, what should you do? Pray pray about it. Pray that God would... 
Convict them? No, it's not what he said. He said what you should do is you should leave your gift. In other words, in other words, don't come in here and sing to me. Don't come in here and sing songs to me when you're not right with somebody else. Don't give me your tithe money when you're not right with somebody else. Don't volunteer to serve more when you're not right with somebody else. Go and make it right with your brother or sister. And then come back and bring your gift. Where you've used your words to hurt, just use your words to heal. And ultimately, where this happens is if Jesus has your heart.